Shannon Waller here and welcome to Team Success. Today I'm doing a very, very special author interview with one of Strategic Coach's coaches and clients, and I hope I can say my new friend, Justin Jones Fosu. So Justin, I am ecstatic to be talking to you about your new book called The Inclusive Mindset, which I have poured through and highlighted large pieces of. So thank you for that. So anyway, I want to introduce everyone to you because I want everyone to go grab the book, especially since diversity and inclusion, it's always been a relevant topic, but it's certainly a little bit more in the news. A lot of people are very confused about it. It can be a very polarizing issue. And you have added this incredibly clear and heartfelt and articulate voice to the conversation. So I want everyone to get a chance to experience that. So let's jump in. And again, just so everyone's aware, you're in the Strategic Coach Program. This is super cool. You've also been coaching our leadership team and our company when doing your diversity and inclusion workshops with us, which have been spectacular. We had one on Friday and it was so heartfelt and so incredible. So that's my experience with you when I'm to have you all to myself for the moment, but let's just have you introduce yourself a bit because I'm sure I would leave out major important things. So who is Justin? What do people need to know about you? Yeah, so I uh, like long walks on the beach uh, by horseback. No, joking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he also has a great sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> so I am a proud papa of two high energy kids, which is part of my big soul identity piece. And I uh, love them. Lydia, who is nine. Peter, who turned six today. So I uh, was super, super pumped about that. I am the son of, of Valerie Jones and Augustine Kwesi Fosu. I was born in Michigan, but originally from Ghana. It's a whole different conversation. So I have actually dual citizenship of both Ghana and the United States. And my mom raised me as a single mom and two rambunctious little boys. <laughs> so a lot of my worldview is shaped through my mom's lens and the approach that she took with us and continuing to expose us, but also give us unique experiences. So that for me, as I've, I've traveled across the country in many different facets and forms, and I've kind of dabbled in a lot of different things. And so, you know, I grew up in Michigan and then I spent about 14 years in undergrad and grad school in Maryland. And then I went off to do more studying in Mississippi and now reside in Charlotte, North Carolina. I've been a member of worked at the Red Cross. I've had an internship with Coca-Cola and Pfizer. And so it's just a very, very experience. But at the end of the day, Shannon, I'm a human being. I'm a part of this thing called humanity. And I, I want to see it treated better. Mm, I really appreciate that. Talk a little bit about your mom, because she's a pretty special human being and was really doing a somewhat unusual role for a woman at that time. Yeah. So describe a little bit about your mom's accomplishments because she's a cool lady. Yeah, so I am a proud mama's boy. Uh, and I say it all the time. I walk around arm in arm and hand in hand and people probably think we're together. Like, what is, what is this? But that's just the affection that we have. But I remember just, you know, growing up with my mom and I lived with her since I was four. I had limited interactions with my dad and we didn't have a lot of money early on. And really for majority of my upbringing, there was like one small stint of homelessness, but my mom worked her butt off and I loved what she did for us. And so my mom, before she had me, she was one of the first black female air traffic controllers in the Air Force. And she would sometimes share her story because I, I just recently realized where this came from. You know, like we always like to think that we're like the originator of ideas and thought processes. And then we really take a, a, a look at our journey. We realize so many aspects of community and life that have influenced us in major ways. And so probably like last year, I came to understanding like, wait a minute, this whole way that I approach diversity and inclusion is because of my mom. And I was like, I didn't interview my mom for this book, right? And so, so I interviewed her. And I was like, mom, like what inspired you to engage with us in this way, right? To do all these things. And so I kind of tell you what she did, but my mom said that, you know, she would be stationed in Japan, that she would notice that there were sometimes two years where some of the soldiers didn't even go into the country. And she was fascinated by how they could be in a whole different viewpoint, perspective, world, and not engage it. Mm -hmm. And so she was committed that my brother and I would not be like those soldiers. She calls herself a child of the universe, which I think is some poem that she continues to tell me I need to look up that I haven't done yet. So I don't want to get in trouble. But the interesting thing is that my mom, not only will we go out to things, and so because we didn't have a lot of money, we did what everybody would do. 
is that we volunteered. And so we went to Oktoberfest and the Polish festivals and Hispanic Heritage Month and all these places, but we also brought diversity and difference into our home by having exchange students from France and Japan and two from Germany for a year and one from Brazil and, and all these places. And my mom early on was doing something so phenomenal. She was planting seeds of the inclusive mindset in me so that I would engage difference, not as wrong, but as a place to understand, right? And even if I disagreed, that I could do it in a respectful manner. And so I credit my mom with really facilitating just this, the whole mindset I have around uh, diversity and inclusion, which I call the inclusive mindset. And she's a really dope woman. <laughs> so I'm sure this word's gonna come up more than once in our conversation, yeah. <laughs> but when I first had a chance to meet you and the word dope came up and I'm like, okay, yeah. that has a different context for you than it normally yes. does for me. <laughs> so explain how you use dope. And by the way, if you ever have the opportunity to have a session with Justin, which I would highly recommend, you'll get to know and be very, in a fun way, very familiar with dope. Yeah. So what does dope mean to you? Because you totally recontextualize it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for some people, dope is represented a drug and kind of in the urban context, what are the things that you'd often hear, you know, it's like something's dope. It means very good. Like, wow, that's dope, right? Like, that's a very good thing. That's an awesome thing. You even, you know, see some people in the religious context that rock shirts that say God is dope. So it's something that's really positive and strongly positive. So almost if I was saying, wow, Shannon is fantastic, is the same emphasis if I said Shannon is dope. Cool. Yeah. So we always type in TWD in the chat of our Zoom room, which means that was dope and when something was really good. So that's a new part of my vocabulary. And Justin, you're wearing a beautiful t-shirt right now from your company, which is diversity is dope, <laughs> yeah. which is really cool. Yeah. Just before we jump in, I want just one more little background. So talk a little bit about your company, Work Meaningful, because that's, you know, you've got a pretty cool, I mean, your education impresses me, what you do in the world impresses me, you speak 60 times a year, which is a lot. So talk to us a little bit about what you do on a, in your work as, as a client, as, yeah. as an entrepreneur. Yeah, so I'm the founder and CEO of Work Meaningful, which is a company designed to help individuals and organizations to work more effectively uh, on purpose and uh, focus on two different areas, workplace engagement and diversity and inclusion. And those have been really passionate research areas for me. And so on the workplace engagement front, I started noticing this really big thing that society is uncovering about meaningful work, right? Mm -hmm. But one of the misnomers that I began to discover is that there's a lot of people who are trying to find meaning in their work. But I found in the research and in my own experience, as well as others, is that it's not about finding meaning in our work, it's about bringing meaning to our work. One is looking in the external to find it. So it's looking for the perfect situation. It's looking for the perfect boss. It's looking for, is my company doing things that support X cause that I believe in? But the research actually bore out that people could actually bring meaning to their work no matter what situation they're in. So I wanted to challenge people, not that organizations that are meaningful shouldn't exist because they very well should, but just that we could take ownership no matter which situation we're in. I mean, I don't know if people have had a chance to read Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, an amazing book. Um, and he talks about it as a Jewish person who was in the concentration camps, just how even in those situations, how he was able to experience this aspect of meaning. And it's really a transformative thing of the way that we show up. So that's workplace engagement. So I help individuals to bring meaning to their work and leaders to create cultures where people can bring their best meaning. Because for some strange reason, we as leaders, we sometimes think that we create engagement. No, we don't. We just create environments where people can best engage themselves. So that's workplace engagement. The second piece of diversity and inclusion is really just helping to normalize it, like make it every day. That's why I did a whole clothing line called Diversity is Dope. And with the inclusive mindset, it's less of a mandate. It's more of a mindset. It's less of a big initiative. And it's more of a part of our everyday lives. And when we can see and experience it from our everyday experience that diversity and inclusion is all around us, it's, it's just, do we choose to fully engage it? That's the big difference maker. And so that's the thing that I've seen set people and organizations apart is when they approach it as a mindset and not a mandate. Mm, brilliant. Well, I know I definitely want to have another conversation with you already about bringing meaning to work. <laughs> so yeah. I love that. But let's dive into diversity and inclusion because that's really what the inclusive mindset is focused on. And this is a 10-year effort 
on your part to pull all of this together. So let's define diversity and define inclusion. And I learned so much from the conversation that you have in the book. And it really is a conversation. It's incredibly well-written, so articulate, beautifully researched. I loved it. And again, I've highlighted huge parts of it. But let's define diversity and inclusion because you have a way of saying it that landed with me different than other things I've heard. Yeah, so in order to define it, I first want to define what it's not (laughs) because I think it's helpful to really do that. So one, diversity isn't just the big three of race, gender, and sexuality. That there's so many different aspects of diversity from ability to mental health, from country of origin to religion to politics, all of these things, are you rural or urban, right, that play into diversity. And so unfortunately, some people, we've talked about diversity and inclusion as the big three. So people don't see themselves as part of the conversation. Guess what? We know this is management and leadership 101. If you don't see yourself as part of the conversation, you don't choose to engage it. <laughs> you like let those people handle it. And so the first piece of it is it's bigger than just the big three. It's also not diverse in me. And diverse in me is a term I created to talk about like how sometimes we approach diverse inclusion as it's my specific difference. It's a difference that represents me. And if that's what it's always and only about, that's not diversity. That's actually called selfishness. And the interesting thing is that when we get up and stand up for the needs of others, even when it has nothing to do with us, that's true diversity. Diversity also doesn't mean that we're all going to sit by the camp fireside, old hand singing Kumbaya, right? And walking around singing unity, unity. Like that's not real diversity. Real diversity is when I can disagree with you, yet still respect you. That I can vehemently disagree with your ideology and yet passionately pursue your humanity. And Shannon, we've lost the art of being able to just engage people as human beings, no matter their ideology. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, what diversity and inclusion really is, it's what I call an inclusive mindset. It's a curiosity of people. It's a wonderment. It's doing our best to understand and hear the perspective of others. It's allowing other people to have grace and to sometimes make mistakes as they learn and grow and develop, but it's more a focus on how do we progress and move forward versus feeling sense of shame because we're not doing everything right. Mm. And I think that's one of the things I appreciated about, well, A, about working with you, and second of all, in the book, is there is this, it's almost like the difference between abundance and scarcity. It's like there's a graciousness. Yeah. It's not like do this or do that, or you're right or you're right. wrong. Your book is not polarizing. You actually demonstrate through all of your concepts and the way you put things is how we can give ourselves grace, give other people grace in this conversation. And, and as you say, diversity just means different. Yeah. Doesn't mean bad, doesn't mean good, just means different. different. And if we can if we can just hold it like that. And I underline, I highlighted, you know, curiosity and wonder. Yeah. You know, it was like, oh my gosh, I just need to approach situations and people with curiosity and wonder. Yeah. Which also means I need to be in my best self. Yes. If I'm grumpy, if I'm tired, if I'm hangry, if I'm just ticked off because the world isn't going the way I think it should, pretty hard to come at things with curiosity. <laughs> it is. But that's what this takes. So it's kind of a reminder to be a good human, just saying. Yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, that would be a good way to operate in the world. <laughs> so I found that I found that pretty interesting. There's like five different directions I want to go in this conversation right now, just to say that. Let's talk about circles of grace for a moment, because I think that's one of the sessions we just did, but it also, it's a profound model. One of the things I like, and it's not unlike one of the things I really love and appreciate about Dan is he helps me know how to think about something. Mm. So your circles of grace is just a phenomenal mindset model to help me understand and other people understand. So talk about circles of grace, because that's a neat you're like, oh yeah, I do that. So right. <laughs> tell me more. Tell me more about the circles of grace. Yes, yes. Yes, the power of three words. Tell me more. So the circles of grace for me, before I kind of talk about what it is, let me tell you talk about why it came about. So an issue happened for me several years ago, probably close to a decade now, in society and I went on social media. And for some strange reason, like everybody saw this one thing in a completely different way. It didn't seem too far off from where we are today. And I was like, how in the world could this one event happen? But we all see it differently. So I started digging into some of the research. I'm a researcher by heart. And I started understanding a little bit of things and I started coming across things like social isolation theory and all the other pieces to be able to better explain 
why we see people in events the way that we do. And so I was like, well, let me create something to help people to not only understand why they see people in events the way they do, but to actually begin to challenge that or expand their circles of grace. And so what I found is for the most part, we tend to give ourselves the most grace, benefit of the doubt. You know, we knew if we were being funny, if we're being sarcastic, we knew if what we're trying to communicate was something that was unique to our country or to our socio-geographical area, right? Then after that, the next circle is family members and friends. And that's how, you know, somebody could have done something like little Johnny could have done something. And little Johnny's mom's like, no, not my little Johnny, right? And, you know, little Johnny could have been a security camera like, mom, I'm sorry, I did it. And little Johnny's mom is like, that's not my little Johnny. I don't know who little Johnny that was. It must have been his little evil twin that I didn't know he had. Wait till we get home. I mean, that aspect of family member and friends, or somebody could do something and their family member or friend would say something like, I don't see how they could do that. They're just a good person. Mm-hmm. Then after that, the next circle is people like you and or people like those that you love. Mm. And that's how you could hear someone say, that could have been my son or my mom or my sister. Then after that, normally is outside of the circles, and that's everyone else. Mm -hmm. And these are people that we tend to give no grace, no benefit of the doubt. They're guilty until proven innocent. Right. Um, When we hear a story about them, we look at them side-eyed like, yeah, they probably did it. But there's other people who were close to in proximity that we tend to offer a sense of grace, and we don't often realize that we're doing it. We see them and we say, oh, I remember myself in them. Or it's like, oh, that reminds me of my husband, or that reminds me of my partner. Like, these are things that we begin to do. But through very personal experiences, I realized that we can enlarge our circles. Mm-hmm. And that's one of meaningful relationships and exposure. And the reason I say meaningful is that it has to be deeper than, hey, I have two white friends. Yay! Like, <laughs> like we have to be able to talk about the hard and challenging issues and still come back to this place of trust and exposure as a place because. Oftentimes what we do is so easy to confine ourselves to our circles of comfort that we never explore. And so we start, quote unquote, canceling people outside of our circles that don't agree with us, that don't share the same ideology. And we lose opportunities to engage people in sensible conversation around difference. So I do a thing that I encourage people to do. I call it the six month challenge, but sometimes when I work with organizations, we call it the circles of grace challenge where I challenge people to go to an event, whether virtually or in person, to experience something or engage with someone in either which they disagree with or don't know a lot about. Mm -hmm. And my six months challenges have been transformative for me. They've been helpful. It doesn't mean I always walk away like, oh, yay, I agree with everything I learned. No, there's oftentimes I still disagree. But what it does allow me to do, Shannon, it allows me to hear directly from people and from the groups Versus getting this second and third hand information that comes from social media, news, other places, which I wouldn't want done to me. So that's, in essence, the circles of grace, a very practical way that people can begin to enlarge their circles and challenge how they think about people and events and groups. Well, you had us identify our everyone else, which was very enlightening, Mm -hmm. (laughs) a little confronting for most of us. By the way, lining it with like circles of comfort and circles of grace. That's powerful. Who are we comfortable talking with, relating to, you know, who do we know versus who we don't know? And then how do we learn about them? Yeah. Yeah. Regular media, second, third, fourth, fifth hand information. And we tend to make judgments and we don't do the, I guess, work. We don't make the effort to go and connect with them, Justin. So that was super It was very insightful. It's interesting. I'm an avid reader. You're a researcher. I'm not, but I'm a reader. And, (laughs) but I'm like, in this conversation, it was in my group, we were talking about young black men. My daughters are 18 and 21. Mm -hmm. I love their friends. They're super fun. I just have this affection for 20 somethings. Anyway, but I'm like, okay, I need to meet. I want to meet someone. I want to know what his experience is like, because I'm like, I don't know that. And I'm not going to run into it frankly, in my pretty white neighborhood. So it was like, that's part of my six month challenge is I want to befriend someone who's outside of my current circles, I should say. Not that that person's my everyone else, but I realized I don't know someone. So I need to make that connection. And for other people was other people. So that was just kind of interesting. I want to talk about the difference, but welcoming and inviting. And just to go back to our a little bit of our leadership conversation, one of the points you make in the book is that it has to be a personal experience 
for a leader before it becomes a company yes. experience, right? And that's so critical. So if we're thinking about wanting to be embrace diversity and inclusion and what does that mean? It has to start with you. <laughs> yes. Person sitting in your chair right now. But there's a huge difference between welcoming someone in versus actually inviting them. Can you talk about that? Because I thought that was an absolutely brilliant distinction. I was like, oh, that makes sense. Absolutely, Shannon. And to your point, you know, your first point just around, you know, I'm often asked by CEOs and our leaders, how can we help make our organization more diverse and inclusive? My initial response never is about their organization. My initial response is, well, tell me how diverse and inclusive is your current life? Because that for me lets me know, is it going to be a long lasting component of your organization or just a temporary strategic plan? Mm -hmm. And the organizations that have leaders who've identified opportunities to do that within their own lives and also expand in organizations, I've seen have a longer lasting impact mm -hmm. in how it lives out in their organization. And so the first piece is living that out personally first and then doing that. Mm -hmm. but, but to the point around welcoming versus inviting, part of the way that CEOs and people can do that and live that out and leaders and, and coaches and, and entrepreneurs is not just being welcoming, but to also be inviting. So I learned several years ago that there's a difference between the two. I know. And I was doing like a eight city tour. And I remember I stopped in this country store. I was in a rural part of the South. And I remember hearing this guy yell at the top of his lungs. He was like, this door is not made for left-handed people. And, you know, I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, the door's left -handed. like, you know? And so I started kind of engaging this whole concept of like right-handed, left-handed people. And I was like, wait a minute, let me dig deeper. And part of that understanding is I realized, oh my gosh, they live a whole different world. And so oftentimes we say everybody's welcome. And so we say like, awesome, people are welcome. And welcoming is a good thing because it will shake your hand, whether right or left-handed. It will engage you. It will smile at your face. But there's an expectation that people go back to their circles and that you'll go back to yours. That's welcoming. We're inviting is being humble enough to go into other people's circles, but also to be humble enough to be invitable uh, and invite other people into your circles. That's the big difference. And so when people say welcoming versus inviting, if we had to define diversity and inclusion, if people have ever struggled with what the definition behind those two is, is diversity is welcoming. It's I'm glad you're here. Where inclusion is inviting and it's I'm glad we're here. And so we look for opportunities to draw people in. We look for what's missing. We ask questions. Like I remember posting on my social media, like, hey, the women in my LinkedIn community, how can men better support women in the workplace, right? And so I got some amazing responses and answers back from people that talked about, hey, if you see us not in committees or assignments or other things, to ask questions why, to dive in deeper, to not just accept, well, I guess there's no quote unquote qualified women or, you know, but to ask deeper questions and figure out or ask us or how we're doing. or what. And so it made me realize that there's a better job that we can do to be more inviting and one great way to do this. So the practicality of this, Shannon, right? Because everybody's like, that sounds good, but what's the practical part? Part of the practicality of being more inviting, one of the great ways we can be inviting is actually hearing the stories of others and those that we lead. And so I call it one MC over W, right? And once MC over W simply stands for one meaningful connection per week. Mm. And identify members on your team, people within your organization, people in your community, where you can block off time, just maybe 30 minutes a week and have meaningful conversation to better understand their story, where they're from, their journey, their perspective, because that allows us to not just be welcoming, but finding ways to be more inviting. Mm, I love it. That distinction, you know, I'm glad you're here versus I'm glad we're here. Yeah. You know, that's profound. And I learned something too, and I think you mentioned this in the book, there's a sense of otherness. Mm -hmm. There's a short conversation about microaggressions and things like that that you point out. And I didn't understand that for a while until actually someone said something. It was actually someone really close to me. And they said something and I was like, oh, I feel other. Mm. I'm like, oh crap, now I get it. Yeah. Now I get it. And I didn't like the feeling at all. Yeah. It's horrid. I'm like, okay, I'm down with this. <laughs> Immediately correct my behavior. But that's not fun. So anyway, that one meaningful connection per week makes, then you have a we, 
Yeah. Right. You can't have a we unless you have that connection with people and that brings them into your circles of grace. Yeah. And then also in that conversation, it really goes back to your point about being curious and have a sense of wonder. And you have us do this amazing, actually, this is in our first session, where it's like everyone has a story. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Holy mackerel. It was amazing. So someone from a particular ethnic background might have that kind of a story. Yeah. As a woman, I might have a story related to being female. Someone growing up in urban or rural. Yeah. Someone who's differently abled, right? They may have a learning disability, right? Or, totally. Yes. Well, we all have different stories and ways we approach it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was a small town kid, moved to Toronto, and I was this stupid gullible one for a long time. That took a while to become a city kid. That was awkward. <laughs> you know, everyone has a story and it affected all of us, you know, when we shared some of them in the group really profoundly. So it's so good. So one of the things that, I mean, there's so many different directions we could go, Justin, but one of the things that I find is... Two points. One is one of the things I left our last session with, and this is also you bring out in the book, is that really this is ultimately about respect. Yes. It's like this whole thing is about respect. And who do we give respect to? And who do we not do that with? And it was, it was, and then I went down and talked to my, immediately talked to my family about this because my, right. you need to know this. <laughs> and up your game was really what I was saying. But it, it's, you know, when we're pushing people away or we don't like them or we don't let them do things or we don't include them yeah. or we don't invite them, yeah. it's not respectful. I mean, I don't want to oversimplify it, but it was just a powerful word for me to leave with that this is about respecting other human beings Period. for who they are. Period. And it was, I'm like, I can remember that. Yeah. You know, it was one of those really powerful messages. So thank you for that. And, and Shannon, That's and, actually why I'm sure. And before you leave off that point, one of the things I didn't mention in the book, there's so many things in 10 years doesn't fit into a 192 page book, right? But one of the things that we've often looked at respect in, I think, a challenging way. I see respect, I can only bring it how I see it. I see respect almost like forgiveness. Mm. And people talk about that forgiveness is not about the other person, it's about you. Right. Right. So that's the same thing with respect. We've almost adopted this mentality that people have to earn our respect. Mm, yeah. And if they haven't earned it, then I'm not going to give it to them. But we choose how we show up and who we engage and how we show respect to people. So let me give you a great example. So one of my colleagues, that is a former skinhead and so a person who had very kind of big racist ideology and those things. One of the things that, as I just asked to hear more of the story of how that transformation happened, one of the things he shared, he's like, hey, like, I loved it when people called me names. I loved it when people would yell at me and call me a bigot and call me. So I loved that. That actually riled me up. I felt better about myself when I got that. He said, well, made it more challenging and what planted seeds is when the same people that he had these negative ideologies about would actually show him respect, would take the time to engage and to listen or to treat him as a human being, even if he didn't treat them as one. And that was the thing. And again, I'm not saying everybody has to take that approach, but one of the things I realized is that respect is a choice we make to give people, not something that people are. Nice. It's a choice we give people. Oh, fantastic. I love that. Let's get a little bit into how people can take action. And one of the things you point <laughs> you point out in your book and in the stories is when people talk about diversity, it means a whole bunch of different things, right? Race, gender, sexuality, all the things. Right. And you've mentioned a bunch more. So what can people do to kind of expand their thinking? What can people do to take action a little bit to push those boundaries of comfort? Yeah. You talked about the six-month challenge, you spoke up at an event where you talked about, you know, voicing for women. You actually went up to the organizing committee of the event to say, there's women here too, but you had all male speakers. Maybe you can look at yeah. changing that next year. So yeah. what are some things we can do to speak up? You know, the one meaningful connection per week. Talk about the three by five, because you've got a neat way of encouraging people to kind of, even at the beginning, educate yourself right. so you know more. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of practicality because at the end of the day, <laughs> You just can't be in theory with diversity and inclusion. It's here. It's around us. And so I love that you called that out, Shannon. One of the things that I've often found with my clients was that they had hearts that wanted to learn and grow, but they just didn't know where to start. Mm -hmm. 
So I created the three by five beginner allyship model as a way for people to begin to enlarge their circles and to begin and grow in the education process. But before I get there, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up just how we approach the conversation is so vital. Great. Carol Dweck does amazing work around growth versus fixed mindset. And essentially fixed mindset is that we only want to do things that make us look good. We don't want to showcase our quote unquote ignorance. And especially we want to look good compared to other people. But the gross mindset looks at opportunities to grow. If I don't know something, I don't know it yet. Mm. So I took the inclusive mindset and the growth mindset with the foundational work that built into the inclusive mindset, because how we approach it allows us to say, hey, I mean, I know about that culture or that group or this type of person or where they come from yet, but there's an opportunity for me to learn and to grow and get better. And so the three by five beginner allyship model is a practical way to do just that. So I encourage people to talk to three people, watch three movies, read three books, I'm engaged in three podcasts or videos, podcasts like this, or three journal articles as a foundation to gain better understanding about a group, an issue, a person, a community, because it allows us to better begin to understand. Again, it doesn't always mean we'll agree, but at least it gives us a way to engage. And so I tell people, start with where you want to start, right? Some people may feel more comfortable starting with movies or podcasts. I personally prefer to start with three people. And for me, that reason is because I don't trust everything I see on the internet. (laughs) So I may not always go to the right journal article or the right podcast. And I may be swayed in a different direction versus what maybe three people would say, hey, this is actually a legit podcast. Check this one out. This is really a good thing that you should check out. So that's why I prefer people. But some people are better at uncovering factual places than I am. Okay. That's one practical way to do it. Well, actually, let's just share a couple of those resources that I listened to, I watched. So one is the Carol Dweck Mindset YouTube video, right? She's got several. Yes, she has a lot. If you've not read Mindset by Carol Dweck, please do. We will have you (laughs) raise your children and yourself differently. (laughs) It will get you into the progress, not perfection mindset. So huge. And I love yet. I wrote it down all over my pages. Every time I work with you, there's something very freeing. And as I talked about at the beginning, very gracious about that. There's something abundance-minded yeah. about the word yet. You don't have to be perfect right now. Yes. And then Verna Myers, is that right? Yeah, Verna Myers. Her talk. Can you mention that? Because it's so good. Oh, yeah. She's so dope, right? <laughs> she has a TED talk that's a really popular talks about in terms of run towards your bias. And where she just shares her story about just engaging bias. But, you know, I love one of the examples she gives. And I don't want to ruin it for everybody if you choose to watch it. But she just talks about how, you know, she was out on the street and with one of her diversity educators and they were out on the street trying to figure out where they're going to get something to eat. Kind of like, where, we, where should we go? And she saw this really big black man that was across the street. And so she ran to him. She's like, hey, like, can you tell us where we should go? Da, 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 da. And she came back and gave some directions and advice and stuff. And her person that she was with who was non-black. I forgot the exact race or ethnicity. And she was like, uh, how'd you do that? Like, I wouldn't have been the person I would have gone to to ask for direction and advice. And it made her realize, she said, wait a minute, like, for her mind, she's tall. So she's like, yeah, my, my dad's a big black man. You know, my I have big black brothers, you know, like my sons are big black men. So that's who I naturally go to. So for me. I know black men. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I know it's not even just black men, but big black men, tall black men. You know what I'm saying? Like some people may see it as a threat, but those are people who exercise great levels of comfort in her life. Mm-hmm. So just that aspect. And so that's part of the whole circle of grace piece of enlarging our circles and engaging those who are either are everyone else or people we don't know a lot about because it's so powerful. So check out that TED talk. It's really, really good. But yeah, so Carol Dweck's work on mindset, also Brene Brown's work on vulnerability. Mm-hmm. We haven't gotten to that with my working with you all in strategic coach, but when we get to the rediscovering dialogue and exercising empathy, stage, she actually has a really good short about empathy. So if you went to YouTube and typed in Brene Brown empathy, you would see this really cool video that showcases that, you know, that we often get empathy wrong, Mm -hmm. that (laughs) we sometimes confuse empathy for sympathy. And really, she doesn't talk about this, but empathy and pity, 
Yeah. Like feeling sorry for someone. That's not empathy. Empathy is when we're in it with them. When we see something, Psychology Today talks about seeing something from someone else's skin, right? Imagining our world and theirs. And oftentimes we say things like, if I were you, I would. We're not them. We won't have their experiences. Or we say things, and I still mess up in this too, is we often say things like, oh, 100% understand what you're saying. And even if you went through something extremely similar, none of us will 100% understand. So even challenging our language to say things like, I better understand. Mm. Because oftentimes people are like, no, you don't. You know, yes, you know, you could be part of a marginalized group or underrepresented group. But that doesn't mean you understand what it means to be disabled or to be blind or just so many different aspects of this. That there. So those are three resources I would really, really highly recommend. Carol Dweck's Mindset. She has some great YouTube videos. Brenna Myers. She has some books as well, but her YouTube TED Talk is really, really amazing. As well as Brene Brown. I work on vulnerability and her really her talk on empathy. Cool. By the way, the section of your book on dialogue is phenomenal. It's dope. Thank you. Yeah. And one of the things that I want to stress after reading the book, because you've got tons of coaching for leaders, you've got tons of coaching if you just want to be a, an even better human, you know, these are things we need to be doing anyway. You've applied it to diversity and inclusion, but frankly, this is what makes people good leaders, period. Yes. You know, and being able to better appreciate the uniqueness of your team and the context that they're coming from and allowing people to show up as their most fully expressed contributing self that they possibly can. So this is a leadership book. Yeah. as well as a book on diversity and inclusion. And it's how to think about it. You know, one of my favorite things about Dan is, you know, Dan says the problem is never the problem. The problem is not knowing how to think about the problem. Mm. And you, my friend, have, that's powerful. it's so true. <laughs> and you have given us an incredible way to think about it. But there's one other aspect before we wrap up, because I could talk to you for days. And we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but it's not just how to think about it. It's yeah. actually how to feel it. Yeah. You know, one of the things that you bring to this whole conversation, Justin, I told you this before we hit record, is that there's a heartfeltness mm. with your work. Like you will feel differently reading this book than not. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. So you bring a heart to it. There's a lot of head conversations. It's very easy to get polarized and our world seems to be more polarized from your research yeah. rather than less, which is a challenge. Yes. But you have a way of bringing the humanity to it, yeah. which is not an easy thing to do. And I'm sure it comes out of your own experiences and your amazing mother. Mm -hmm. But talk about that for a moment, because when people can feel it, you can't unfeel something. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I think it enacts permanent change. What are your thoughts on that? No, 100%, which is funny because before, and I was struggling with what to call this approach, because before the inclusive mindset became the inclusive mindset, it was actually called everyday diversity, moving from head to heart. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So that was the you know, original title of this work, because what I found is there's a lot of people who had great head knowledge about diversity and inclusion, but very few people who had hard knowledge about it. And that's where I felt true and saw true transformation happening. Yeah. It's not just that I can think about it cognitively, but that I can also emotionally connect to it in meaningful ways that relate to me. And that's why I say it's everybody's part of the conversation. And that's the essence of why stories are so vital is that they connect us. And so like even, uh, I haven't gotten to this with you all, but I'm working with you know top car company, an international car company and working through their headquarter leaders. And one of the things is we're walking through exercise empathy and rediscover dialogue. And one of the stories or one of the breakout sessions that we do virtually right now is tell a time where you have felt on the outside or not included. Mm. And what always amazes me is that everybody has one of those stories. <laughs> It doesn't matter who you are, what you look like. It doesn't matter if you're a part of a marginalized, underrepresented group. Every single person has had a time where they have felt not included or othered. We talk about it. Oh. And it allows people to feel it from their perspective, their hurt, their pain, how they felt in that moment. And my challenge to people, not only after we debrief, is why in the world would you ever want anybody else to feel the way that you felt. Mm. And that brings it back because we sometimes forget that we ourselves have gone through that. <laughs> so that's one of the things from a heart perspective that I think is helpful. So that's one piece. But the other piece, just about the heart, is at the end of the day, how we connect to people, we can often 
just write off people cognitively. Like, oh, they're not this, they're not that, they're blah, blah, blah. I can debate with you. Uh, is that the right? Is I over the T? I don't know. Uh, right. And so we can do all of these things. But when we come back down to the foundational level is that these are real human beings. And I almost uh, yeah, I challenge somebody with this phrasing. We should treat diversity and inclusion and embrace it the same way we'd embrace our closest loved ones mm. because we want them valued. We'd want them shown dignity. We'd want them respected. Not that we think everybody should agree with them and their perspective and their viewpoints, but they deserve a level of value simply because they're human. And we get to that place, Shannon, where we see and start treating people like family. That's one of the hidden things people know about me. I call almost everybody fam. That's short for family, right? I call almost everybody brother and sister. Like, how you doing, brother, right? It doesn't matter what race you are, what, you know, and for people to identify, I call them fam, right? And so, like, one of the interesting things for me is I do that super intentionally because I want to consistently remind myself that we're all family. When we engage people that way, yes, we have differences in our family. Yes, there's some people in our family that we don't like. <laughs> yes, some of our uncles and aunties, they have some ideologies and thought processes. And, ah, but guess what? Guess what we come back to, Shannon? Their family. Mm. I'll sit down and eat with them. We'll laugh, laugh together. And that's where we need to get back to as a society. Very cool. So, Justin, what's your vision for this book? What's your vision for diversity and inclusion? My vision is one of <laughs> that people engage people with a sense of wonderment and curiosity. I really want the world to be a place that my two little kids can grow up in. And not only can they respect and value and dignify other people, but that it would be done to them. Mm-hmm. That we begin to change the trend on empathy, mm-hmm. which from 1979 to 2009 showed roughly a drop, of, I think around about 48% decrease in empathy and 39% of perspective sharing that we can begin to reverse the trend and start having empathy for others. Not that we agree. Empathy doesn't mean agreement, but it is seen it from someone's perspective that we can engage others every single day with wonderment Mm. that we can respectfully disagree while honoring other people's perspectives that people start to feel included, right? And heard where even marginalized or underrepresented voices begin to become amplified where we can stand up for other people and ultimately that we can realize that we can actually make mistakes because anytime we try something different, we're bound to uncover landmines and things that we shouldn't have done or said. And I still do it stuff. I still mess up. I still say the wrong thing. But at the end of the day, that it becomes a part of our everyday lives and everyday journey. So as people read the book, that they'll apply it to themselves first. Mm-hmm and have leaders that will create places and spaces where people can engage in the beauty of diversity and inclusion in more meaningful ways in their organizations and their communities. Mm, I love it. Thank you for painting that picture. Yeah. And treat people as people. Yeah. I love it. So how can people connect with you? How can they get the book? Where can they get those super cool t-shirts? Like how can they get more Justin? That's what I want to know. Yeah, so uh, the book can be found on Amazon. Right now, it's currently in Kindle and paperback form. And the next couple of months, we'll be coming out with the paperback and audiobook. So those will be available. And you can find me at workmeaningful.com. Uh, that's the website. You can see the, the work I'm doing on the inclusive mindset, but as well as workplace engagement there. And I love connecting with people on LinkedIn. So I'm Justin Jones Fosu on LinkedIn. And we have some pretty interesting conversations. You'll sometimes see some stuff that has nothing to do with business on there because I think that we are all well-rounded people and that our personal lives impact our professional lives and our professional lives impact our personal lives. I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan of your workout videos. I appreciate it. (laughs) Now, I don't post all of them on LinkedIn, only the ones that I can make a point with. So for those, you have to go to Instagram. For all of them, I post on Instagram and I'm at iWorkMeaningful on Instagram and Twitter. So yeah. And if you just want to call me, like, I mean, 
I know we've gotten to the digital age, but like, give me a call. Um, 704-750-5574. And that's on my website as well. So if you forget the number, just go to workmeaningful.com because at the end of the day, it's how we engage people. I love it. Not too many people give out their phone number anymore. That's very sweet. And how can they get those awesome clothes that you are wearing? Yeah, so diversity is dope line. And we have other shirts that are coming out. You can find that on shopmeaningfully.com. You can also get it through the inclusive mindset.com. So you can go to that page, you'll see apparel. And we have face masks, t-shirts, tanks, hoodies, all the kind of stuff. One of the cool things, not only about the apparel, but also the book is that for every purchase of a book, of every purchase of apparel, that we are donating dollars towards organizations that embody the inclusive mindset. So currently, those organizations are Asian Americans Advancing Justice and the Challenged Athletes Foundation. Mm-hmm. In our first week, we were able to, with the help of strategic coach Babs, woohoo, Babs is so amazing, and we were able to donate $2,000 to those organizations. So now, you know, while I gave a little bit more for that first week just to kick off, but the giving never stops. And so that at the end of the day, it's not just about the work I'm doing, but other organizations are doing really amazing and great work. And so you can purchase on purpose because it really helps to fulfill the organization. What a good term, purchasing on purpose. Well, Justin, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing the work that you're doing. One of the things I appreciate about you, it's true in the book, it's true in conversations is how open and vulnerable you are and how much you share yeah. the wins, but also where you've been tripped up or, you know, all of that yeah. and your own personal experiences. And it really encourages all of us to do the same. You know, as you said, to wrap up, you know, a lot of people have head knowledge, but they don't have heart knowledge. Yeah. And I think that to me is a hugely part of your contribution to this. So thank you. You've expanded my heart knowledge of this. Mm. I think it is truly your gift and your unique ability. And I just want everyone to run out and get this right now. I've got the Kindle version. I have the paperback version. I'm looking for the Audible version. That'll be super cool. Yes. Yes. It's coming. It's coming. I hope there's some singing involved. Just saying. Well, you know, I may have to make that up. But no, just for those who might be interested, we are doing some things with bulk orders. And so people can just contact us directly on email us at engage at workmeaningful.com or call us because we do in bulk orders. We do do some try to provide some discounts for organizations. I love it. Justin, thank you, thank you, thank you for being you and for the amazing book, The Inclusive Mindset, and for hanging out with me and with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Shannon. You're so dope. Yay! You're so dope. Love it. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.